the very first lesson in this series, we learned that forces can be split up into two main groups, contact forces and non-contact forces. The focus in our investigation so far has been on contact forces. In today's lesson, we will investigate two of the most common types of contact forces, the normal force and frictional force in greater detail. The reason we are particularly considering these two forces is because when you look at everyday examples of forces in action, these two forces are almost always present. Let's see what we'd like to achieve in today's lesson. By the end of the lesson today, you should be able to identify and label the normal and frictional force in free body diagrams of forces acting on objects and apply your knowledge of forces and Newton's laws of motion to solve problems. Let's start by looking at exactly what the normal force is. When an object pushes down on a surface, in other words, exerts a force on it, the surface will in turn exert a force away from the surface and acting perpendicular to the surface on the object in accordance with Newton's third law. This force is called the normal force. As with many scientific terms, the everyday meaning of the word normal does not apply here. This term actually comes from geometry and you should remember it from the work you would have covered in geometrical optics. If a surface and a line are at right angles to each other, we say that the line is normal. So any line that is at right angles to a surface is called a normal line. And so the force coming from a surface and acting away from and at a right angle to the surface is called the normal force. Now let's examine the forces that act on me when I sit on a chair to see if we can identify the normal force. We will do this by drawing a free body diagram of this situation. Remember, the center of gravity of my body is represented by a dot. We draw the forces that act on me on the dot. All objects on Earth are attracted to the Earth. From what you have learnt about gravity and mechanical energy, you should know that we call this force of attraction of the Earth on a body, the body's weight. So we can draw in the force of the Earth acting on my body and I will label it weight. There is also another force acting on me. The chair pushes up on me to support me in the sitting position. So we draw in the force of the stool pushing up on me. Because of Newton's third law, I know that this force must be directly opposite to my weight and equal in magnitude to my weight. We use the same type of symbols that we use in maths to show that two things are of equal magnitude in science. So we mark both these forces to show they are the same size. But what else can we say about this force? Do you see that this force is coming from the surface of the chair and is acting perpendicular to the surface of the chair? This means that this must be the normal force exerted in this situation. While I'm sitting on this chair, my body is at rest. It's stationary. I am going nowhere. I'm just sitting. This very obvious fact tells me something about the resultant force acting on me. Newton's first law of motion tells us that a body will remain at rest unless a resultant force acts on it. So because I'm not moving, we can conclude that there is no resultant force acting on me. The sum of the two forces acting on me gives us a resultant force of zero. We can say that the forces are in equilibrium. Look carefully at this diagram again. Do you think this tells us that the normal force is always the reaction force counterbalancing the weight of the body? Let's look at two more examples to see if we can answer this question. What would the normal force be if someone pushed down on my shoulders with a force of 60 newtons while I was sitting on the chair? Where would we find the normal force if I push this box against a wall? If someone pushes down on my shoulders, the magnitude of the force exerted on the surface of the chair is now 60 newtons plus my weight. The surface of the chair exerts an opposite force equal to the sum of these forces. This is the normal force. In the example with the box, the box experiences a force due to gravity equal to its weight and exerts a force equal to its weight in the opposite direction on the earth. But the surface of the box is interacting with the surface of the wall. So the normal force in this case is the force perpendicular to the surface of the wall equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the push exerted by the box on the wall. I hope that you can see from all these examples that the normal force is often but not always the reaction force of weight. 
Now let's move on to a more complicated example of force in action. Here we have two learners on a playground pulling against each other. If the girl is pulling the boy towards her with a force of 250 newtons, we know that, according to Newton's third law, the boy must also be exerting a force of 250 newtons on the girl towards him. But the girl manages to pull the boy so that he accelerates towards her. Let's analyze this situation to find out where the resultant force that changes the state of motion of the boy comes from. We will do this by drawing a free body diagram of the forces acting on the boy. We have already established that there is a pull to the left of 250 newtons acting on the boy. What other forces act on him? Well, there is his weight, pulling him downwards to the earth, minus 500 newtons, and the normal force of the floor supporting his weight, 500 newtons upwards. These forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. But do you see that his feet grip the ground? It is here that the second force that we want to investigate today, frictional force, comes into play. The force of friction between the surface of his shoes and the floor acts against the direction of motion. He accelerates forwards. This tells us that there is resultant force acting on him in this forward direction. So the frictional force of his feet on the ground is less than the pulling force that the girl exerts on him. Friction arises from the sum of all the tiny forces of attraction that particles on the surface of the plane exert on the object. So frictional force is largely dependent on the material or matter that makes up the interacting surfaces. We can also say that friction is the force that resists motion on a surface. Now back to our example. Let's assume that the frictional force is 100 newtons. Can you calculate the boy's resultant acceleration from all the data we have collected in our diagram? Once again, we must recall what the master of motion taught us. Newton's second law describes the relationship between resultant force and acceleration, and it gives us a formula that we can use to calculate acceleration. It states that... The resultant force is equal to the mass of the body multiplied by its acceleration. Substituting the values which we have been given, we get the resultant force is equal to 250 newtons minus 100 newtons divided by his mass, which is 50 kilograms. So his acceleration is equal to 3,0 meters per second squared forwards. Whenever we analyze force acting on objects, we need to refer to Newton's laws. So let me give you a tip. Learn how to state his laws and learn what each law actually tells you. Then you'll be able to pick out which of his laws to apply to the situation as you solve the problem. And remember, Newton's laws actually apply to all situations at all times. The way in which we use them depends on what we need to calculate or explain. Now let's look at another situation. This example should further clarify things around normal force, weight, and the direction of frictional force. Here's a girl on a normal bathroom scale. You should remember that this type of scale is designed to convert weight into mass to give you a reading in kilograms. The reading on the scale says her mass is 52 kilograms. This means that she has a weight of 52 times 10, which gives us 520 newtons. So she pushes on the scale with a force of 520 newtons, and the scale pushes up on her with a force of 520 newtons. When the girl stands on a bathroom scale, the reading on the scale gives the magnitude of the upward force exerted by the scale on her. That is the force perpendicular to the surface of the scale and acting away from the scale. This is, of course, the normal force. Now let's tilt the scale. We will put it on an inclined plane, that is, on a slope. Should the scale read the same force when it is on a slope? Oh, this is interesting. She seems to have lost some mass. The scale now reads her mass as 50 kilograms. We know that things cannot just lose mass. So why has the normal force reduced when the scale is on a slope? We can work it out by drawing a free body diagram.
Firstly, her body is represented by a dot. I have also drawn the slope and its angle to the horizontal into the diagram so we can clearly see where the other forces act on her. The normal force is 500 newtons and it acts perpendicular to the surface of the slope. Her weight is 520 newtons and it acts downwards to the center of the earth. Because she is standing still, we know that there is no resultant force acting on her. The resultant force must be zero. There must be another force acting up the surface of the plane to keep the girl stationary and the other two forces in equilibrium. You've guessed it. It is frictional force. This force acts along the surface of the plane. Now for the really fascinating part of this demonstration. When forces acting on a body on an inclined plane are in equilibrium, we can rearrange the forces into a perfect closed triangle. You will learn more about why this is when you get to vector components in later grades. Before we end this lesson, I want to spend a little more time on frictional forces. Frictional forces play a very important part in motion. Without friction, we would not be able to walk on level ground. You will find this out very quickly if you've ever tried to walk on ice. The type of frictional force that has to be overcome to start motion is called static friction. And the frictional force that has to be overcome to stop things is called kinetic friction. Do you remember how I told you that friction is dependent on the type of material the interacting surfaces are made of? Well, this gives us the power to minimize and maximize frictional forces as it suits our needs. We maximize frictional forces when we use them to do work in stopping something moving. In situations where we require speed or where friction can damage the actual surfaces that are interacting, we would need to minimize friction. The first and most obvious way of doing this is to smooth the surface and polish them. But there is a limit to the amount of smoothing and polishing that can be done. And sometimes we need quicker methods of reducing friction. Oil acts as a lubricant between surfaces. Frictional forces are drastically reduced by lubricating the surfaces. Ball bearings also reduce friction. Cars and bicycles make good use of ball bearings, as do many machines. Even the hand-powered egg beater in your kitchen makes use of ball bearings to reduce friction. Essentially, we minimize friction so that we don't waste too much energy. Machines transfer energy to do useful work on things. If too much energy is used to overcome friction, this reduces the effectiveness of the machine. For example, if you forget to put oil into your car engine, it will seize up and require a complete overhaul. Your task for today is to find out more about how we reduce friction. Set up an apparatus to carry out your own investigation of frictional forces. You can do this by attaching a rubber band the center front face of a block. Also attach a short ruler to the front face of the block near the rubber band so that you can measure the amount of stretch in the band when a force is applied to it. It is useful to mark the unstretched length of the rubber band on the ruler. Put the block on the tabletop and stretch the rubber band until the block starts to move. Mark the length of the rubber band on the ruler. Measure the stretch of the band. Repeat this procedure a couple of times to get the average stretch of the rubber band when the block starts moving. Try different ways of reducing the friction on the tabletop. Take readings of the amount of stretch of the rubber band under these change conditions and use these to decide what the most effective way is to reduce friction between the block and the surface. Write a report on your findings. Enjoy this task and join me for our next lesson when we will find out more about forces acting over a distance.